I'm delighted to say that Philip Lane, uh, who many of you will know as the former governor of the Bank of Ireland, um, is now uh, uh, the European Central Bank's um, chief economist, and he will be joining me on stage uh, for a fireside chat uh, without the fire. Um, um, so, Philip, please do join me on stage. A very interesting start to, to this morning's uh, agenda. A lot of talk of uh, all the political uh, difficulties that are around. Um, uh, one uh, more depressing thing to uh, uh, add to the agenda is coronavirus, um, which I thought would be a uh, maybe slightly depressing but important place to start um, because central banks are starting to think about this um, outbreak very seriously. I think the uh, Jay Powell, the, uh, the, head of the, New York, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve in the US, um, made remarks about it the other day in terms of potential damage to global growth. Um, where do you and the ECB sit on this issue? Well, I share the assessment of Governor McClough in, in his remarks that this is essentially a, a, a wild card, if you like, that it, it's, it's a new event, it's a genuine uh, uh, uncertainty uh, which has arrived now. So how do we as a central bank think about it? Step one, we go back and look at previous uh, virus episodes. So of course, the, if you go back, uh, the lesson from the uh, previous cases that look like this is essentially, yes, you can have a pretty significant short-term uh, hit on the economy, but then uh, because containment happens, uh, essentially a lot of uh, spending plans get cancelled and postponed. But once the, the virus is contained, uh, these uh, uh, plans re-emerge and there's a significant bounce back. So that's, if you like, the baseline is uh, you, you will read many comments that there could well be a significant revision in the short term but if you look at a year, uh, then the overall impact on the path to the world economy might be uh, relatively minor. And of course, for monetary policy, uh, it's a medium term uh, impact. Monetary policy works with a lag. So we, we don't respond uh, to shocks that, in, in the base case, only will, will be temporary. Let me emphasize, by the way, uh, the nature of our monetary policy is we afford guidance. So uh, in fact, uh, as the news develops day by day, the yield curve moves. So the yield curve is moving, it's providing automatic response uh, to, to the news. But I think, and uh, I think it was in your remarks as well, of course, compared to the uh, SARS outbreak, the world, China, China is such a big part of the world economy now, both in terms of as a source of demand, and also as very important in various supply chains. So, you know, I think it's, it's a case of uh, every day, uh, lots of people in the ECB and across the Euro system and globally are keeping a very close eye on this. Um, and of course, uh, step one is, is, is not for central banks. Step one is a public health issue, how to contain uh, this virus. And uh, until that happens, uh, the uncertainty will be elevated. You mentioned there the, the importance of forward guidance. Um, or the role that it helps play uh, in adjustment. I think um, I was struck by um, Madame Lagarde's comments in the recent, uh, her recent statement uh, uh, in terms of ECB monetary policy, which I'm, I'm guessing you were very involved with, with uh, drafting, where it talked about forward guidance will ensure that financial conditions adjust in accordance with the changes to inflation, for example. Um, that seemed like, a, from some experts I've spoken to, a, a shift of language to, to talk about that it will ensure financial conditions adjust. It, it expressed more confidence, <laughs> I suppose, in the ability of forward, forward guidance to, to, to be important. Uh, is, is that a significant shift, or is it just, uh, no, uh, are we reading too much into it? <laughs> correct. So I think if you go back to President Lagarde's first con press conference, uh, the first thing she said, which, by the way, is not unique to her, I think it's for all of us, is maybe people like you, maybe the market uh, commentators spend way too much time trying to divine uh, what we say. We really do not uh, have that kind of very uh, 
uh, careful Machiavellian, well, if we change this word here, if we change that word there, we're sending some kind of hyper subtle signal. So, you know, it's exactly the same message, I think, uh, for years now, that we do think forward guidance is uh, extremely helpful. That, of course, the short-term policy rate, the deposit rate, uh, you know, in a mechanical sense, of course, only influences short-term financial conditions. If we want to influence the uh, one-year out, two-year out, five-year out uh, swap rates and so on, the market needs to understand our forward guidance. And we see it, they do. They absolutely understand our forward guidance and the, the whole yield curve does respond. Let me say is uh, this goes only so far because, of course, uh, the initial part of the yield curve is anchored by our deposit rate. Um, so we do say that in terms of our overall strategy, uh, the rates would be kept at current or lower levels uh, until we see inflation uh, pick up sufficiently. And so for a big enough shock, for guidance will not do everything. But for, the, for these kind of intermediate events, such as the virus, uh, it can do quite a bit. If you, by the way, it's not unique to us. If you look at the uh, Fed, the review of its policy, and if you look at uh, this very important recent paper by Ben Bernanke, the presidential address to the American Economic Association, where also for the Fed, Bank of England as well, BOJ, uh, communicating uh, the forward guidance is essentially central to central banking these days. It does seem to be, absolutely. Now, there's increasing talk in the Western world, particularly in Europe, about the Japanification of, uh, of the economy. Um, and uh, by chance or, or good luck, we, our next speaker is actually the president of the government pension uh, investment fund from Japan. So I'm fascinated to hear uh, what we will hear uh, there. But I just thought your view on the extent to which Europe uh, in particular can learn lessons from Japan, both in terms of the policy response, the kind of growth, um, anemic growth for, for long periods, demographic change. How are you thinking about this? So this is a, you know, it's a, the world of communication is very interesting because so much is read into that term, Japanification. So uh, if we survey this room, what people take away from that phrase may differ quite a bit. So let me uh, differentiate. So as a central bank, and I think uh, I, my colleagues um, in the Japanese system, I think will agree with me on this, is one fundamental lesson is do not get into a deflation trap. So Japan spent nearly 20 years with in negative inflation. Uh, there's, a, there's a big system-wide uh, pivot from 2013 onwards, which has been successful in returning Japan to positive inflation, which I think is quite important. But I think uh, we take the lesson, the, the Japanese officials take the lesson is, do not get into that situation in the first place. So this is why in, in a lot of our policy uh, assessments, and I, I gave a speech last night on this, you have to be energetic to make sure you don't allow inflation get into that territory. So that, 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 that's for us as a central bank a big important lesson. Uh, but then more broadly, uh, some of the other lessons from Japan are basically Japan was essentially uh, at the forefront of some uh, trends which are global uh, and mostly dem demography. You know, I, I, the quote you had this morning about from Paul Krugman about productivity isn't uh, everything, or you know, but it nearly is. Uh, I, when I was thinking about that, I said, well, maybe you can replace productivity by demographics. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, they're obviously very interconnected. But of course, because uh, if you go back to the narrative of Japan, per capita growth has actually been quite good. So per person, productivity in Japan is quite respectable. Japanese, Japan is a very successful economy, uh, you know, it's really impressive in many ways. But when the workforce is shrinking, the overall growth rate for the economy uh, and the overall uh, dynamics of saving and investment, which of course feeds into the interest rate environment, is so different. 
So now we have uh, China in terms of aging, you have uh, various parts of Europe in terms of aging. So I think uh, for us and uh, the world, understanding how to deal with an uh, aging population is very important. And maybe the last point I would say though is, uh, because uh, we've gone further in terms of the negative interest rate policy, uh, other tools, if you make a calculation today of where is the inflation adjusted interest rate, uh, we've been successful in Europe in pushing the inflation adjusted interest rate uh, to a lower level than, in, than what's possible in Japan. And that provides more stimulus, and that's why we have our central forecast of inflation climbing from 1.1 this year uh, to 1.6 two years from now. And we see it, by the way, in the underlying core inflation. Inflation is going up. Uh, uh, it's visible in, in the wage inflation data. And so under our base case, uh, we are expecting this gradual but visible move up in inflation and therefore uh, provide a buffer away from the deflation zone that we would be so concerned about. So you will get to 2%? Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, uh, you know, we want, we're not going to declare victory until, until we get there because in the end, uh, you know, we like our models, we like our projections, we put a lot of effort and talent into it, uh, but let's be humble about it. <laughs> but on the other hand, now, because uh, if you, wage inflation has been locked in for about two years now. So two or three years ago, there was a debate, where's the wage inflation? Uh, there was a long time, the recovery from the crisis was so slow, and the crisis was so deep. There was skepticism, you know, loss of union power, globalization, therefore wages are never going to grow. Wage inflation is significant in the euro area now. Uh, in those parts of the economy where labor costs are a big part of it, uh, in uh, non-tradables and so on, services inflation is now fairly significant. Uh, the, the last sector to move is manufacturing, uh, where inflation is relatively limited. And of course, with the uncertainty in the world economy, we can point our finger at some uh, contributing factors. So the, the, the scenario where inflation is climbing, and remember, the Fed is more or less where it should be. It's a little shy, but in the zone of around two. So the idea that it too is unthinkable and so on, I think that narrative uh, uh, doesn't hold much credibility. Let's talk about Brexit um, and, and your assessment of the likely economic impact. Um, there's been a lot of chatter in the last couple of days about uh, what form of deal might be done on financial services between uh, the UK and the rest of the EU27. Um, talk of permanent equivalents, which I guess from an economic uh, impact point of view would be desirable because it would basically guarantee uh, as close as you could get to um, status quo. Uh, this has been rejected out of hand uh, by Mr. Barnier. Uh, obviously, there's negotiating tactics here, but um, what's your kind of assessment of, of what's at risk here and, and what kind of uh, agreement would be best for, for um, economic, mitigating eco economic impact, particularly on the financial services side? Sure, so I mean, I think there's a sharp distinction. I mean, of course, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, negotiation this year about, because the spectrum of what's possible in terms of a, an agreement on, tra on trade and goods is quite wide. Uh, now, of course, compared to the earlier scenarios where maybe something close to customs union, uh, uh, where there'd be a lot of close alignment, that looks more distant in terms of uh, goods trade. And the further away we are from that, the bigger the trade friction. Uh, so th that will have consequences at a sectoral level. So for many industries, they're going to have to deal with that. At a macro level, for the euro area economy, the UK is just not big enough to really move the dial substantially in terms of how we think about the future of the euro area. It, it's there, we see it, it's non-zero, uh, it's definitely something we worry about, but the UK is just not big enough compared to our collection of global trading partners for a, a macro uh, issue. At an industry level, of course. For individual regions in the euro area, of course. But by the way, uh, when we uh, 
we have very similar calculations to, to as in uh, Governor McLeod's uh, assessment that over a 10 or year or steady state horizon, this, this is going to be uh, a significant loss. Um, but remember, over shorter periods, in this, you know, the, the, where, how it plays out over shorter periods will depend on the policy response in the UK. Uh, the uh, Bank of England response, the fiscal response. So when you have a, a kind of shock like a trade shock, uh, how that ends up in short-term GDP and competitiveness will depend on the, uh, whether it's compounded in the financial markets and then how the Bank of England and the Treasury responds. On financial services, uh, there was never going to be any strong expectation of free trade and financial, as you know, the, it, this is not part of the typical trade agreement. So it, in the end, it's going to boil down to these issues about equivalence. Um, uh, Sir John Conliffe spoke in Berlin yesterday as well, where you know, I broadly uh, shared the assessment is that uh, your area, uh, whether it's through the central supervisory functions of the SSM, the European supervisory authorities, or the uh, responsibilities at national level, the financial system is global. We know and we have very strong relations with the Bank of England, the FCA, and so on. We have very strong day-to-day -day supervisory relationships, and the world understands how to supervise global complex organizations. But going back, you know, the equivalence issue, uh, you know, this is for the negotiate, I think for the European Commission to take the lead about uh, regulatory philosophies, outcomes-based equivalence and so on. Uh, so I think it's, it's something that it's very hard uh, to predict from the outside, but there are red, will be red lines in terms of making sure the very interesting single market in the EU27, which is not going to recreate London, it's going to be a dispersed financial system, some activities here, uh, some in Frankfurt, some in Paris and so on. Uh, the single market, I think, is a very... Uh, fascinating uh, and rock-solid uh, way to organize the European financial system. Uh, but there's no doubt about it, it's going to be, remain deeply embedded with the City of London and uh, other centers. And we will, I'm sure, once the regulations are there, once the uh, political level of negotiation has concluded, uh, the supervisors will know how to work with each other. Can I ask you briefly about climate change and what you see as central banks' role in managing it, uh, both from a monetary policy point of view and a macroprudential point of view in terms of the safety and soundness of, of, of the financial system? Maybe I'll make, I mean, and again, this is something that uh, will be very important this year in our strategy review. This is already here big time. So, you know, my area of the ECB, we're, we're trying to understand what's going on in the European economy and to make projections. Um, so even before I arrived and when I was on the governing council through the Central Bank of Ireland, what happened in uh, the very hot 20, summer 2018? Uh, so the weather shocks are already a big part of how, what we struggle with. What's going on in terms of the implications of a summer that's too hot? the implications on transportation, on energy companies, on pharmaceuticals. There's many ways already weather shocks matter. Uh, another big issue is uh, the transition to a lower carbon economy. Uh, Trying to predict, you know, what's happening to the future of the car industry. You know, we all know, the European car industry has had a big uh, shock in the last couple of years. Some of that is temporary. Uh, some of that is trade war related, some of that uh, relates to all sorts of uh, fiscal policies in different countries, but some of it is the uncertainty about uh, the future of transportation. It's responding to new emission standards and so on. Uh, so already, as you know, in my work in, in trying to understand the European, it's a big issue. And then let me emphasize when we turn to other dimensions of our policies, is our preferred route is 
global and European governments adopt the necessary climate policies. If there is clarity about, say, the future of carbon taxes, other emissions, then the work for the central bank is obvious. Because then the world is going to re-rate uh, different types of uh, financial securities because they'll have a good understanding of the implications for different sectors. The uh, European project on the taxonomy is already, I think, quite helpful, by the way. So uh, we can play our part, ideally, by supporting all of that. Uh, the implications for us in terms of risk management and so on will be obvious. Let me say, by the way, right now, with the super accommodative monetary policy, that is supporting the transition because debt finance is you know, uh, fairly accommodative. But the big issue, in, I think, for uh, green investment is equity finance. Our work at the ECB is highlighting actually a very important element because it's risky. We don't know which technology is going to be important. Uh, we don't know uh, uh, the, the uncertainty such. Equity financing is super important. So I think uh, maybe uh, in terms of the hierarchy of what is important and what is needed, uh, these other elements are more important. But we know what we can do and what we need to do. And so we, will, I think, will not be found wanting in supporting the transition. Time is running short, um, or has run out, according to that clock. Um, but I've got to ask you one final question as an Irishman. Uh, when you look at the uh, political situation here, uh, and the surprise uh, boom in the vote for Sinn Féin, for example. Um, how much can, of that can be attributed, do you think, to um, monetary policy? I'm, I'm, I'm stretching a point here, perhaps, but you know, housing has been a huge issue in, in Ireland, uh, and it's one of the things that Sinn Féin cam campaigned on. Um, and the reason, well, at least one of the reasons why we have housing bubbles all over the world, but particularly in Ireland, is because um, there's been a, a huge bubble in the asset prices in areas like property. How much do you, do you share that simplistic view? Okay, so, so, so let me try and uh, not get uh, too involved in the, the, the local issue there about attributing, uh, trying to understand the vote. Mm. And by the way, I think it's very important, you heard it from the Taoiseach and Minister Darcy in terms of, in terms of the big fundamentals of economic policy, there's a high degree of consensus across the European uh, system, or the Irish system. But what's very interesting, and here is uh, where I think uh, it's dangerous to use the phrase bubble, because what we're seeing across Europe is credit overall terms remains fairly subdued. In those countries in the periphery, including Ireland, by and large, uh, credit indicators have been falling over the last number of years because a lot of people had excessive amounts of debt and the big narrative has been reducing that. What is true is a low interest rate environment does, has led to a repricing of uh, property, uh, whether commercial or housing. But as you know here, because uh, over the you know, last uh, number of years, the macroprudential framework has been quite successful in terms of limiting financial risk taking in, uh, home, in the home ownership market. Uh, and then, of course, when you, in, maybe in the big story in Ireland and uh, maybe some other countries, is the, the rent issue. Rents have gone up quite a bit. And so when you think about that uh, in uh, various locations, including here. Uh, part of that is, if you have a very strong economy, lots of the employment growth here has been very strong. Part of it is the, again, the fallout from, from the years when construction here did go to a very low level. Uh, it did overshoot. It overshot in the mid-2000s, as in too much being built. It overshot in the crisis of too little being built. So by the way, I mean, this, the fundamental lesson for central banks and regulators from that is let's not have that boom-bust cycle. And so the, the determination uh, which you know, went back to uh, 2014 with the Central Bank of Ireland to put in place a best-in-class macroprudential framework, I think remains the right answer. The correct answer here is not, uh, if you like, uh, 
to encourage uh, households to take advantage of the super low interest rate environment to take on excessive debt. This would not help. To get the supply up, uh, there's all sorts of policy choices. And as you say, the election had a range of policy choices about how to improve affordable housing. Uh, but for, for, you know, I don't think uh, monetary policy is at the heart of that. Okay, I thought you might say that, but uh, it's, a, it's a fair point as well. Um, we have really run out of time uh, this time, but um, I'd really like everyone to join me in thanking Philip Lane. Thank you. Thanks so much.